Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning, and we're grateful that we have this opportunity to worship together, to spend time together in God's Word, spend time praising Him and thanking Him for all that He has done for us, and to spend time encouraging one another to uh, keep going, to keep fighting the good fight, and to have that, that fellowship that we have in Christ Jesus. Uh, it's a great blessing to be here. Last week I started talking about the gospel, and I wanted to continue on with those thoughts. Last week I, I talked about kind of the contents of the gospel. What is contained therein in the gospel? And today I'd like to talk about the nature of the gospel. Of course, last week we talked about how the word gospel simply means good news, that there is good news that God reigns, that God is in control, that He has sent His Son to die on the cross for our sins, and that Jesus reigns, He is our King, He has taken away our sin, He has defeated our enemies, and so we can live in service to Him now. We can live as slaves of righteousness, as Paul talks about in Romans chapter 6. That is the good news. But as we talk about the nature of the gospel today, uh, another word that I, I thought about using was the substance of the gospel. What is, what is the gospel like? What is uh, the gospel all of, about? And what can we describe the gospel as? And, and more accurately, what does the Bible describe the gospel as? So we're going to look at a few things here this morning. Number one, the gospel is salvation. If you turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. <laughs> this passage in, in verse 16, probably one familiar to most Christians, where he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to, for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Paul says he's not ashamed of the gospel. He was going to come and preach the gospel in Rome. He had not been there yet, but he wanted to go there. And we know, of course, eventually he does go there by appealing to Caesar. But he says in almost this thesis statement of the book of Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it is the power of God to salvation. That is the gospel, the good news about Jesus and what he has done for us is the power of God. It is how God works our salvation. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Everyone who has faith in Christ Jesus can obtain this salvation through the gospel. Paul also talks about this over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians, excuse me, chapter 2 and verse 13. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Paul says, But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith and truth. It was for this He called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> And he goes on to tell, tell them to stand firm and to, to hold fast. But in some translations, uh, uh, well, he, he says in verse 14, it was for this he called you. What is this he's talking about? Well, he says that in verse 13. It was salvation. He chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. He called you to salvation through what? In verse 14, the gospel, through our gospel, the, through the good news. And so we understand that the gospel is salvation. It is being saved from our sins. It's being saved from the wrath to come. We are saved through the gospel. Also in the New Testament, we understand that the gospel is a revealed mystery. If you would turn over to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians Chapter 3. And we'll start reading in verse 3. Caleb read this for us earlier and gave us kind of the fuller context, but we're just going to read verses 3 through 6. Paul says that by revelation, 
there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Through the gospel. Paul will talk in, in Ephesians about this and he'll talk in other places about this that the gospel is, it, it was a mystery, but it has now been revealed. In Ephesians chapter 6, same book, chapter 6, and verse 18, Paul says, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf, that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth, to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. So there, there's that phrase again. He uses it kind of multiple times through the book of Ephesians. What is a mystery? It's something that's unknown, right? It's something that is not yet revealed in a lot of cases. Sometimes mysteries are never revealed, but not in the case of the gospel. It was a mystery how God would work out the salvation of everyone. It was a mystery that God had also included the Gentiles into his plan, into salvation for men. <clears throat> but all of that is made known through the gospel. It is the revealed mystery. The good news is that Jesus has died for all men and that all men can become children of God through him. The gospel is truth. Over in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul talks about this. 1 Timothy chapter 1 And we're going to kind of start in the, the beginning of, of a sentence, <clears throat> starting in verse 10. Paul is talking about unrighteous people and how the, the law is, is meant to condemn those unrighteous people, but also meant to, to turn them toward good living. He says, and immoral men, and homosexuals, and kidnappers, and liars, and perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So Paul says that sound teaching or true teaching, the truth is the gospel. The, go the gospel tells us what sound teaching is. It tells us what truth is. And we see this also in Galatians chapter 1 as well. Galatians chapter 1. And verse 6, Paul talking to the Galatians, he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. So Paul talks about the gospel here. He talks about how the Galatians were going after another gospel, and we'll talk about that concept in just a moment, but they were going after a different gospel. But he says, if somebody's teaching to you another gospel, if somebody's trying to give you other good news, Contrary to what you've already heard, he's to be accursed. Well, Paul doesn't come and outright say it there, but the reason for that is Paul has given the truth. He's given the true gospel. The good news is the truth. It is what is God has revealed to him through the Holy Spirit. It's true. It is right. It is correct. It is factual. But what does Paul say about those who are, are preaching another gospel or those who are going after another gospel? 
He says those who are preaching another gospel, let them be accursed because they're not teaching and preaching the truth. If you're going after another gospel, he says it's really not another. And you know, we see that today, don't we? We see a lot of people who are coming out and they're preaching what they call the gospel. It's good news according to them, but it's different good news. It's not the same good news as what the Bible preaches and what the Bible says. And they're telling you that you can be saved by some other way than what is preached and taught in the scriptures. And we may call that a different gospel. And Paul uses that same terminology. (coughs) But ultimately, he says that good news that they're preaching That gospel that they're preaching, it's not another gospel at all. It's not really good news. It's false. If anybody else is preaching a gospel contrary to what we find in the Scriptures, they are to be accursed. God has confirmed these things. God has showed that these things are true. God has provided ample evidence that these things are true. And so we can't go against that. And some people today want to to minimize the the teachings of the New Testament and say, really, what being a Christian is all about is just loving Jesus. That's it. You just got to love Jesus and and believe in him. and, And the rest of these things, the teachings that you find in the New Testament doctrine, as they'll call it, those aren't as as important. That's not what the New Testament treats the gospel as. The gospel itself is these teachings and how we ought to live in response to what Jesus has to do. And we ought to to take in this truth and not minimize it, but rather follow it because that's what Jesus has revealed to us. It is the truth of what Jesus has revealed to us. And to minimize it, to cast it aside or to go against it And something contrary to that, it's just lies. You know, you think about the idea of the news today. And the the term fake news came up probably about eight years ago now, roughly. Maybe a little bit before then. Uh, Of course, that's not a a new term, but it's kind of a, a new coined term, I guess you could say. The idea of fake news is the idea of, you know, you you see it on the news and the news is supposed to report the facts. They're supposed to report what has actually happened. But they're not necessarily giving you the truth. They're, they're, They're either putting a spin on it to make it seem like it's something else, or they might just tell outright lies. And that happens. Well, somebody who, for example, tells you that in order to be saved, you, you just have to say the, the sinner's prayer. And that's the good news. That's fake news. That's not good news at all. Because it's false. You tell somebody that and you, you pray, have to pray the sinner's prayer in order to be saved. And they pray the sinner's prayer and they believe that they're saved. Really, they're lost. That's fake news or that's bad news, in fact. So we have to understand the truth of the gospel and cling to that truth. Another thing about the gospel, as I've talked about before, when we talked about the mystery, the gospel is worldwide. The gospel is something meant for every man. Another word you could use for that is it's universal. It applies to every person. Turn with me to Mark chapter 14. Even before the gospel had fully been accomplished. Jesus talked about the the universal nature of the gospel. In Mark chapter 14, what has happened is Jesus has been uh, anointed before his his death and burial and resurrection. And of course, there was, uh, you know, some controversy around that. The apostles thought that that perfume, which was costly, should have been sold and, and the money should be distributed to the poor. But Jesus commends the woman for what she does. And he says in verse 9, Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. 
And the fact that we just read that today and have talked about that is proof of what Jesus said. The gospel has been preached in the whole world. Here we are over in the United States of America, far, far from the land that this happened. And far, far from it as re in relation to time 2,000 years later. And yet we're still talking about it. That speaks to the universal nature, the worldwide nature of the gospel. This good news is still being preached. It's being preached in every land to all creatures. And that's exactly what Jesus told His apostles to do over in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Understand this, the gospel is for all. It's for every person. The good news that Jesus has died for your sins and that you can be saved through Him. Everybody should know that. Everybody should understand that and everybody should live that. And sometimes we might kind of get caught up in our own lives and think about just the gospel as it relates to this church or the gospel as it might relate to us as uh, Americans, but understand that the gospel is so much bigger than that. The gospel is for everyone and we should be thinking about it as for everyone in relation to how we ought to think of our fellow man, how we ought to talk to them and how we ought to approach every single day of our lives. Finally, the gospel is a stewardship. The gospel is a stewardship. Stewardship is not something that we talk about in our everyday language, at least for, for the most part. Every once in a while, it'll, it'll come up in, in relation to some you know, kind of legal thing or maybe a trust or something like that. But the idea of stewardship is that it is something that has been given to us and we have a responsibility towards it as well. Over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul's going to talk about his stewardship here, and I, I will make a distinction between his stewardship and ours because I think there is some difference. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our, our, our hearts. And then over in Ephesians chapter 3, I know this is not up on the board, but we looked at Ephesians earlier, and I, I just want to show you that this language has been in some of the other passages that we've looked at. 1 Timothy 1, it, it was there too. But in, in Ephesians chapter 3, notice in verse 2, he says, And if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you. And then in verse 7, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of His power. Now specifically, the apostles had a stewardship. They were given this gospel by Christ through the Holy Spirit. And they were going out and they were entrusted to preach this to all men to make sure the gospel reached all, all people. And they had a stewardship that... <clears throat> In some ways, is different from ours. But I want you to understand that though the apostles had their own stewardship, I think we also see this idea of the stewardship of the gospel for us in other places as well. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, In verse 5, Paul talks to Timothy here and he says, But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. 
The word evangelist is a very interesting word when you look at the etymology. It, it looks nothing like our word gospel. But when you look at the Greek, it looks very much like the word gospel in the Greek because the Greek word for gospel is euangelion. And the Greek word for evangelist is, I believe, euangelistes or, or something close like that. They're, very, they're, they're basically the same root, same word. The gospel is the good news. Well, an evangelist is a bearer of the good news. A good news bringer, if you will. A harbinger of good news, you could say. Well, what does that mean? It means that there were some people in the Scriptures who were also entrusted the Gospel. People not directly from, from Christ, but they have taken up this work to preach the Gospel. And, and they have gone about preaching the Gospel as, I guess you could say, a, a vocation of sorts. Timothy was one of them. Now the Apostle Paul trained him, he brought him up and, and tutored him. Same for Titus as well. We won't turn over there, but we learn in Ephesians chapter 4 that one of the gifts that Christ gave to, to men, and specifically to the church, is evangelists. Good news bringers. I consider myself one of, the, one of them who has a, a stewardship given by Christ. Not by any means of special revelation, but by understanding that the gospel is for all men and that it has to be preached. But understand this, that even if you are not an evangelist, there are certainly passages that talk about how we ought to be telling other people the gospel. and We, we dealt with that a lot last month. But I want to think about our responsibility to the gospel, our stewardship in the gospel in this light as well. Over in Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1. Paul talks to the, the saints in Philippi in verse 5, and he says, oh, We'll start in verse 3 to give some context. I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation, my my Translation says, fellowship is another word. In view of your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And then he goes on to talk about that in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 15. Philippians 4 and verse 15, Paul says, You yourselves also know that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even at Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. The Philippians' fellowship in the gospel was that they supported Paul monetarily as he was going and preaching the gospel. There was a stewardship there as well. The gospel needed to be preached to all men and, and that doesn't mean that every single person should be an evangelist. That doesn't mean that everybody has the same gifts as far as being able to teach and preach and to expand upon the scriptures. And some people, that's just not their role. But that doesn't mean that we don't have, still have a stewardship. The gospel has been entrusted to us as Christians. The good news needs to be told to all men. We have a responsibility toward that. In whatever way we can, our responsibility is to make sure that good news goes out to everyone. For some of us, that means filling a pulpit on Sundays and doing the work of an evangelist. For some of us, that means teaching our neighbors and our friends. For some of us, that means supporting those who are teaching the gospel and preaching the gospel. Whatever our role in that is, we still have that stewardship. And so we often talk about the gospel, about what it does for us and how it helps us, and that's great. 
But remember, the gospel is worldwide. It applies to everyone. And the gospel is a stewardship. God has given us this great gift. But we have to repay. We need to show our gratitude. We need to labor in His kingdom to bring this gospel to others. To glorify Him. And so the gospel is a stewardship as well. So as we close this morning, thinking about the gospel, thinking about the good news, it almost sometimes seems like the phrase good news is a little underwhelming, doesn't it? When you think about how much God has done for us, what God is doing, how He reigns, what, how that affects our lives, how that transforms our lives. Good news almost seems like an understatement. It's great news. It's excellent news. It is amazing news. It's the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. It is salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so we need to understand our responsibility toward it this morning. The good news of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins is good news. But you have to decide what you're going to do with that. The responsibility toward that is still something that we bear. You have to decide how you're going to respond to the good news. Are you going to accept it? Are you going to believe it? Are you going to treat it as the truth? Are you going to live it? If you have not put on Christ in baptism, you're not living the gospel. You've taken what has been done and you're throwing it away. You're making it in vain. Paul uses that language in the New Testament. That the gospel can be in vain towards people. But it doesn't have to be in vain. If you believe in Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, confess Jesus before men, be baptized for the remission of sins, the gospel will not be in vain toward you. But rather it will change you, transform you, it will save you. If you are a Christian, even you can make the gospel to be not in vain. Paul talked about many times that he continued to work, he continued to run, he continued to, to uh, work against his own lust, his own body, so that he would not run in vain. <coughs> If you're a Christian, but perhaps you've given your, your life back over to sin, you've turned toward the world, you've become discouraged, don't make Christ's grace, don't make the gospel become in vain. But rather, turn back toward God and rededicate your life to Him today. So if you have any need this morning, won't you come while we stand and sing?